Um, uh, it's a, my great pleasure to be here with Jason White, who's the director of news partnerships at Facebook. Uh, before joining Facebook, uh, he spent a lot of times in the journalism game, for those of you who uh, like to see journalism cred in your technology companies, working at uh, NBC News and CNN and the NewsHour, and my favorite, stateline.org, a great, a great news publication. I noticed you were also affiliated with the Pew Charitable Trust at one point. At, at one point. I, yes. They gave me a fellowship at some point. Um, and you got your master's in religion and ethics at Yale. Is there any way that you bring that knowledge of divinity to your current job? It's interesting. Early in my career, I, uh, yes, I studied theology and ethics uh, at Yale University, got my master's there. I had actually th considered being a religion reporter. Mm. Uh, I, at that time, that was sort of a, a growing trend uh, among newspapers, was to hire religion reporters. Um, I had a background as a, a kid. I was raised in an evangelical Christian household, just kind of fascinated by the subject overall. Uh, wound up never really putting it to use in that way. I was also very interested in public policy and wound up becoming, for most of my career, really focused on, on policy and politics and that side of journalism. Um, but if graduate school taught me anything, it taught me how to think. Uh, and so that's something I definitely try to do in my current job. That was a more serious answer than my question deserves. So I, I thank you for that. Um, so what you're, you're also the first person to ever ask me about that in any panel I have ever done. No, so thank LinkedIn's you. LinkedIn's not that far away. Um, so what exactly does the director of news partnerships do on a day-to-day -day basis? What, you're over the United States and Canada, not directly yep. over, over Asia. But uh, what are the kinds of things that, that you do in that job? Um, Great. Uh, so thanks all for having us here. Uh, I am struck a little bit by the irony of two guys from the East Coast, United States, with beards sitting up here in stage in Singapore talking about platforms and, and partnerships and, and the news industry. Um, so the partnerships job at Facebook, it's actually evolved a lot over my five years there. Um, when I started, there were just a handful of us in these roles. Uh, the platform was in a very different place then, and especially as it related to the news industry. Uh, not even that many publishers just five years ago were leaning into the platform in a big way. And I think for the average user, they actually weren't even using it very much to get news. Certainly that has changed a little bit over the years. More publishers have leaned in, more people have leaned in. Um, we on the partnerships team are the connective tissue between our platforms and the, the news industry that leverages those platforms. So across Facebook, Instagram, WhatsApp, Messenger, even Oculus at times. Um, many news organiz organizations have both a, a business and uh, editorial relationship with Facebook, um, more formal or informal, uh, depending on the, the organization, but they use Facebook to distribute content, to, to garner audience. Uh, many of them use Facebook for monetization as well. They may distribute branded or sponsored content. Uh, they might use instant articles and use the monetization that is available in there, and then on kind of the, the editorial and storytelling side, uh, certainly Facebook and Instagram um, play a significant role in that. You see increasingly news organizations interested in starting Facebook groups to engage their organization. It's a little bit less of a business play and, and more of, of something to do uh, a different kind of storytelling or a different kind of engagement with their audience. And so my team and, and our expertise uh, is to work with organizations to help them <laughs> leverage those products, but then also to bring feedback from the industry back inside Facebook to make those products better. I, I did notice that uh, your most recent public Facebook post when, on, a few weeks ago when the new Facebook watch shows were, were being announced, you, you said, if you told me five years ago when I joined Facebook that we'd be launching news shows, I would have said you were crazy. Back then, video was not a thing on Facebook, and who the heck got news from Facebook? which, you know, times yeah. have, have changed a little bit there. I, I do want to ask, though, because I think we're, everyone who speaks here is contractually obligated to mention the Reuters Institute report that came out a few weeks ago. Um, one of the big findings in that report was, uh, for the first time, a global decline in the number of people who are using social platforms to access news. And as the report said, almost all of that change was due to a specific decline in the discovery, posting, and sharing of news in Facebook. In the U.S., down from 48% of Americans sharing news or consuming news, I should say, on Facebook, down to 37% in one year, and down 20% among young people in the U.S. in one year. Um, why is that happening? What's your explanation for that? Why are people not using Facebook for news as much? It's a great question. Uh, and, you know, that's survey-based data, and I think what people say in surveys is not always reflective of what they're actually doing uh, on these various platforms, but I do love that, that Reuters Institute report. 
Um, I, I think there's a couple things going on. Uh, we, we sort of picked up after the election just a bit of a burnout among people when it came to news and politics. The US election was extremely intense, as you all know, and quite polarizing, and that carried on through the post-election period. Um, some of the, the, the biggest news days and most news traffic ever on Facebook in the United States, at least, were actually after the election, and it was kind of up to the inauguration and post-inauguration period where there were some early news stories that, that broke some, some surprising news about the new administration from the New York, New York Times, the Washington Post. So that kind of continued on until then, and then it actually slowed a little bit. And I think people um, within that, that space of Facebook, which is primarily, for most people, it's about their friends and family. It is not a news reader app. Um, Apple News is great if you just want to read the news. Facebook is actually not designed for people who just want to read the news, right? You're there to get updates from your, your cousin, a friend from high school, your mom, your dad, um, and that's why people are there. And I think in that environment, um, news takes on a little bit of a different feel, a little bit of a different flavor. And so in a, a highly polarized environment, it can be tough for people to share a lot of news into that space, not knowing who might content comment on it and what it might say. So I think what we saw in that report is people bringing some of that conversation to what they might consider a safer space, a more quiet space, a more private space. So some of the messaging apps and, and things like that. And you know, for us, I, I think that's an interesting trend. And I don't even know if we would uh, have a strong feeling as to whether it's a good or a bad trend. It's just one of those things that we observe and how people use our platforms over time. These are all living, breathing things, and I think we learn from our users as much as we build products and, and put them out there for them. One of the things that, uh, of all the data points that, that I've ever learned about, about Facebook or that ever made, made public about Facebook, maybe the most important one for me was when Mark Zuckerberg in January said that the new set of algorithm changes were going to be reducing the share of news in the, the average news feed from 5% to 4%, um, which on you can read that in a lot of ways. It's a 20% it's a decline, or you can read it as it's only, it was ever, only ever 5% and now it's going to be 4%. Um, I think a lot of journalists misperceive the role of news in the news feed. And I have to say, having observed all the, ch the algorithm changes, the new announcements this year, and Facebook after post-2016 election, part of me thinks Facebook kind of wishes it never really got into the news business. <laughs> that it's, it's essentially been a whole lot of trouble for Facebook, and that Facebook, if it was just the place where you shared bar mitzvah photos and, you know, my cute kid and that sort of thing, Facebook would have been happier in that, in that world. Is that a completely unfair statement or I not? Do th I do think it is because I think we want Facebook sure. to be a place where people can bring their full, their full selves. And I think for, for some people that is discussing what's going on in their community. It could be a school board election. Uh, it could be a crime that happened down the street and they want to alert their neighbors about that. And they, so they're gonna have a, they have a Facebook group for their neighborhood where they talk about issues like that. And then it can get especially charged in a kind of national election environment. But I think uh, for Facebook, it's, 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 for us, we want people to be able to express themselves and share the things that they care about. And for a lot of people, news is a part of that. Otherwise, you are only you are kind of walling off that part of yourself from your friends and family if this is the place online where you are connecting with them. So I actually don't think that's right. And I think what we've seen, I, I would say a lot of journalists were very surprised by that 5% number. Um, they assume all their friends because, are journalists and because their, their friends, friends are, are journalists news. and they're sharing news content and that's their kind of world and they consume a lot of news there that it, it operates as a news platform essentially and um, I think for us what we're seeing is actually a shifting of the mix of news on Facebook and so the overall amount is down a little bit but in subsequent announcements what we said is we're actually going to shift toward higher quality news content and so we're going to consciously try to minimize the distribution and presence of more clickbaity news, of more sensationalist news. Certainly the fake news, as you heard on the previous platform, we very aggressively demote when we... False news, when, right? That's your that's yeah, Facebook when it, term. <laughs> when it's identified. Um, but the flip side is we're also doing more to lift up uh, more higher quality news. Local news, so news that's about your neighborhood and your community, 80% of people that use Facebook have told us they want to see more local news. 
And so we have a number of efforts underway around that to both within newsfeed to make sure people are seeing more local news that they're connected to. And then we're also developing a separate surface for local news within the Facebook app where you might be able to participate in a conversation about your community or see local news reports from news organizations that you're not actually connected to. I know someone raised that idea before that Facebook maybe should every third or fourth sponsored post, there should be a, a, a news story there that's maybe more of a, a verified, vetted news story. Within our local news surface, we are actually showing content that people are not directly connected to, which doesn't really happen in newsfeed, where sharing is the, the main mode of distribution. So we are kind of interested in that topic. We're trying to figure out the right way to do it. Um, so far, local in particular, the early signals are positive, and we're going to be rolling that out to more cities. We're starting in the US, and we're going to look to bring that out abroad. So I can say, in my own experience, you know, I've been on Facebook as long as I've been able to be on Facebook. I do not view it as a place to get news. Twitter is my place to get news um, in terms of social networks. Um, but yet, there are a lot of people, there are a lot of people in the United States and Europe who, for whom Facebook is their number one source of news. And of course, there are other countries that we've heard about and others that we haven't talked about where that, that's even more the case. I'm wondering if you think that it's healthy for someone to have Facebook as the primary news source in their diet. Because it is not designed, as you said, it's not designed to be a news production and distribution platform. That's a thing that it does, but it's only a part of it. It is almost entirely driven by friends sharing, which is an editorial filter, but is maybe not a perfect editorial filter. Um, what would, what would, is, it, is it okay and healthy for someone to make that their the number one source? So I think one of the things we're actually trying to do on Facebook is create deeper connections between publishers and their audiences. A lot of the news consumption on content, as anyone who is on the publisher side knows, is a lot of drive-by traffic. People come in, they read that story, they go back, and then they keep scrolling through their news feed, and maybe they find another story from someone else. And so we're actually building some, some tools so that uh, a news organization can get someone to sign up for an email newsletter much more easily um, through instant articles than they can on the mobile web. It's a native surface, it loads quickly, uh, and we've actually found great success there. Um, we're developing a subscription product within instant articles where there's actually gonna be a paywall within the, the Facebook ecosystem. It's the first time, we, we try not to add friction to content consumption, we try to go the other way in fact and make it as fast and seamless as possible. It tends to, to grow the, the total pie for everyone, but as we've seen this move towards subscriptions in the industry, we wanted to make sure we we're using our products to support that as well. Um, there is hardly any deeper relationship between a publisher and a person than if that person is actually paying for that content. So this is just a first step, putting the paywall in inst instant articles. It is interesting to think about what other things we could do once we know and the publisher has told us that person is a subscriber and you think, well, could that be a signal in ranking? Um, are there other ways that content could be presented to make it stand out and, and make it look a little bit different? So I think there's some things we're doing to kind of deepen that connection to make it a little less incidental, shall we say. We also, um, I think when we talk about news on Facebook, a lot of people think about articles, but video is a huge part of, of the Facebook platform, Instagram as well, uh, and certainly a lot of news organizations, many of them are video first. Um, it's not just something they do in addition to text, it is the primary storytelling vehicle. And we have a surface within Facebook called Watch. Uh, it's a video only surface. Yeah. It is right. not in this region yet. Um, and for that, we actually made the decision a few months ago to commission news content for it. So we are actually working with high quality news organizations to do daily and weekly news content for the Watch surface. We view it very much as an experiment. We don't know if in, in addition to scrolling through newsfeed, people are gonna wanna watch news shows on Facebook, um, but we have certainly seen some success with entertainment and sports, and now we're gonna see if we can do this with news as well. Um, Anderson Cooper is among those people who are gonna be doing a daily news show on the platform. So it's a bold experiment, but it's one we're really excited about, and I think because newsfeed is not a, a primarily just about news, it is interesting to think about, well, what other surfaces do we have to play with where maybe we could have um, a, a news surface where it's a little more intentional and people go there to see specifically what is going on in the world and to get information from high quality organizations. My, my wish for Facebook is at some point someone changes the name of newsfeed 
because it's not a feed of news, but just for clarity's sake. Just call it the feed. Of the feed, yeah. Uh, speaking of video, um, just over two years ago, uh, a Facebook executive caused a lot of heart attacks, or at least heart murmurs in journalists, when uh, she on stage at a conference not unlike this one said that in five years, all of Facebook is gonna be video. And uh, Mark Zuckerberg had, had said something a little bit more toned down than that, but uh, most of the content that people see on Facebook and are sharing on a day-to-day -day basis is video. So that was two years ago, so we have three years left as writers. You're, that's when your, your work is no longer necessary. But the, <laughs> the I, I'm obviously user-created content is a different thing than publisher-created content. But do you, do you see that path? Uh, are we st is Facebook still on that course? Is that a point where in three years we should really anticipate that the work that publishers are you know, distributing on Facebook is, is gonna be overwhelmingly, dominantly video? I think it's very clear that people like to read news. They will watch news video, but um, there are many, many people who prefer reading news content. They tell us that in the surveys. It's available in third-party surveys. Most people themselves are not creating high quality news content for distribution. They might write a little status update. They might post some photos from a kid's birthday party. Um, and so I think we're a long way from the, 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 the platform being primarily video as we typically think about video. I think um, there are some formats that kind of bridge the difference between static and moving pictures and that would be stories. Um, we have the story format within Instagram within WhatsApp and now Facebook, and it is growing quickly within all of those. And a lot of the footage in there is actually, a lot of it is video content. So um, when viewed that way, it, it is true that an increasing amount of what people are consuming is video, if we're gonna call stories video. Um, but I think within the feed environment, there's uh, a lot of room still for text-based storytelling, other kinds of visual storytelling. I think we wouldn't be investing in a subscriptions product if we didn't think, uh, which is primarily about uh, the article form, uh, if we didn't think that had a strong future on the platform, because it's not cheap to put a lot of developers and designers and product managers on that kind of a project. You got money, it's fine. No. <laughs> um, I wanted to ask a little bit about um, of the announcement this week that Facebook was going to be allowing paid subscription groups in a very limited set of, of, uh, of cases. I like that the niches where that the ex it's being tested include meal planning and house cleaning. Those are genres now. Those are, those are areas of news, house cleaning Facebook groups. Um, so people will be able to charge, I think, $5 to $30 a month for access to a Facebook group. Mm -hmm. it, obviously, this is just getting started. It's not getting started in news, but that certainly sounds like something that could evolve into a revenue driver for, for publishers. I'm curious how, to what degree is that part of the thinking behind that? Yeah, it, it's, it's a really interesting opportunity. It's something we've heard from publishers for a while that they'd like more, just first, just more functionality around groups. Uh, we see some publishers have subscriber-only groups, but you can't easily upload your subscriber list to Facebook to invite those people to join a group, let's say. So there's, there's things like that that would just make the product more useful for publishers who are already using it. Uh, the Atlantic has a, a Facebook group as part of their, their membership called the Masthead. Uh, I'm a longtime Atlantic subscriber. It's a great value add for me. I might even pay a little additional money to be a part of a group like that. Um, the original inspiration, though, for the, the paid groups are there's millions and millions of groups out there. Some of them have grown quite large, and it actually takes a lot of time for people to moderate those groups. And they're typically just people who are maybe concerned about their community or an issue or there's a topic that they are really, really, really passionate about. And so we wanted to give them a way to actually make a little bit of money as individuals from this thing that they're investing so much time in. So that's where we're starting. There are definitely other applications that could be really interesting down the line. Um, uh, I, could we switch it into questions like in a minute? In Would a that minute. be okay? All right, sure. Okay, thank you. Um, well, I'll just ask this one last question then. Um, I think publishers, uh, despite the good work of, of your team, Publishers are often a little bit confused about what works on Facebook, what Facebook wants. That implies a sort of corporate level desire that I'm not sure is metaphysically sound. You're the religion degree holder. Um, 
I, I, and there are lots of ways that Facebook uh, could be useful to a news publisher. I wonder if I could ask you to do a very difficult thing in the one minute that we have left. Um, what are the three most significant ways that an average publisher can drive revenue through Facebook? In other words, what are the areas, if, if you were just generic publisher, they just want to make money off of Facebook, they want to you know, monetize in some way, is it instant articles? Is it you know, uh, mid-roll video to ads? Is it, you know, what is it? What are the, the, the best ways? Yeah, it's a great question. I, I, the answer will actually differ depending on the region. I know in this region, instant articles has actually been very impactful for a lot of publishers um, because the data connections here are not always, let's say, 4G. Um, articles can load very slowly in, within the mobile phone. And so the mobile web is not the best format. When you load that article as an instant article instead, um, we see increased distribution in this region anywhere from 40, 50, up to 80% in India. And so you have that increased distribution and you have the monetization where a publisher can bring their own advertising or use Facebook advertising as backfill. And that product has actually been net positive for a lot of publishers here. And we've tried to make it easier and easier over time to on board to it. Um, I think another opportunity, and we've seen this increasingly in the US, is the use of branded and sponsored content. I know that came up a little bit earlier, and uh, you know, you, you wanna make sure you're doing it um, in a way that is, uh, there's clear lines between the business and the editorial <laughs> side. Um, but you can bring that content onto Facebook, keep 100% of the revenue. If you're doing a Facebook Live series that where you're finding an audience and it's really engaging, you can sell that to a sponsor and bring that sponsorship into it and a little bit of messaging and tag that sponsor and you keep all the revenue from that. We don't get involved in that transaction at all. So I think those are a couple of opportunities. I think the thing that I'm excited about that's starting to take off now in the US is direct video monetization on Facebook where publisher uploads a video and we serve up a mid-roll or a pre-roll ad depending on where within the Facebook ecosystem it's being shown. It's actually starting to show more promise now. We have not rolled that out everywhere, but it's gonna be the most scalable way for people to make money from their video on the platform. All right, questions? I think you need to go to microphones if Again, you have questions. Uh, I'm going to just insist that your questions are short, not statements, only questions. I will shout questions. at you if you Thank start you. rambling on. Thank you. And no rambling, no rambling. Go, go to the mics quickly, please, if you have a question. Thank you. Does someone have a microphone in front of them? I'll, I'll, go, I'll jump in, sorry. Uh, Rebecca Trigger from the ABC in Australia. A bit of a soft one to start with. Can you just outline a little bit more clearly how the local news surface that you described will work and integrate into the feed? as a product, how will people be accessing that material? And secondly, because we haven't seen watch in this region, most of us wouldn't be familiar with how it works. So can you describe again how watch will be integrated into the feed? Will people have to go to a separate section to access it or is it gonna be a smoother kind of uh, user experience? Thank you. Thank you, good questions. Uh, and good to see you again. We did a workshop yesterday uh, at Google headquarters and Storyful and Google. They let you in? Yeah, we had a bunch of journalists in this room were there, so thank you. Um, so to your first question, the local news surface, sometimes when we develop new, new products, it's less about how many people can we get into this on day one than is this actually a good experience? And so that's mostly what we're testing with the local news product. Is this collection of stories and local conversations a good experience for people? Um, how we get people into it is actually a secondary question for us right now. So the way it's actually working is there's a little unit within someone's news feed where there's a collection of these news stories and they can click through and also go to the surface if they want to get more. Um, and if they click on any of those stories, they go through to the publisher website. So that's the kind of hook into that product right now. There might be others in the future or it might be surfaced in a different way. Um, for watch, the content that is posted to watch by a news organization shows up in newsfeed uh, like a video post as a standalone mm -hmm. video, but people can also go to watch and actually subscribe to shows there and follow them and get notifications. So if someone is a big fan of a show and they're gonna wanna watch that show again and again, watch is the best way for them to access that content. They may also happen to see it incidentally in their news feed, but as we all know, feed is, is more about that uh, occasional uh, consumption of content and not so great for that intentional, I know I want to watch this right now. Yes, or whoever. Okay. Right there. 
Yes, thank you. I'm Madia from Indonesia. Uh, my question is about the previous speaker talking about several significant steps that are already being taken in Facebook. Uh, billions account have been removed. But uh, what about another platform which is more difficult to handle, which is WhatsApp? Uh, the uh, head speeds, the rumors, the fake news easily goes privately to the uh, citizens and they create violence in many ways. In my country, there is a Vihara, a Buddhist temple, getting burned because of fake news spreading through WhatsApp. So how to handle that? And the second is, uh, there is a love and hate relationship between media and social media because as you know that you disrupt us a lot. So uh, we are the one who produce the content with the discipline of journalism, which is uh, costly. And the one who took the benefit of economy is Facebook, Google, Twitter, and all that. How to balance that aside from at uh, revenue sharing or something? Thank you. No, thank you for those questions. Uh, and that first one, look, that's a really difficult subject. Um, WhatsApp is an encrypted surface. Uh, we are doing more, we heard in the previous panel, to have, um, for content that is flagged, that is reported, and users can, can report content. We also encourage people to report things to their local authorities if they think that uh, there might be something happening and there might be a mob gathering or whatever it might be. We collaborate with local authorities as much as possible when we find out that something is happening. We are adding more local language reviewers as much as possible. Um, for all of the countries in this region, we historically have not had enough coverage. We are trying to add more. I will, um, this is not a Facebook hiring fair. Uh, I know Alvin in the previous one mentioned we're hiring public policy. We actually have eight news partnership jobs open across this region that we've just opened in the last couple of weeks. So for anyone in this Sustainable room- Sustainable jobs. That is really interested in these kinds of, of topics and challenges, and I always think about them as opportunities where you're really trying to build the future of news consumption and relationships with the news industry and how we can better support the news industry. Um, Anjali Kapoor is our new director for Asia Pacific. Raise your hand, Anjali. See her if you are interested. Um, wide coverage across the region, very exciting jobs. Um, so the last question about the, the business disruption, I know you guys talked a little bit about this in the, the first panel. Um, that is a, a super challenging topic. I think when I was starting out in media, it was 2001, I was getting out of graduate school. Already at that time, newspapers were feeling the disruption of the internet. Um, these are very, very, very deep challenges. And I think we were joking before the panel about how there's never really been a golden age for digital media or for digital news. There was never a time where there were enough digital dollars for everyone. And so, I think that what we're thinking about, we're excited about the trend towards subscriptions. That is obviously not gonna work for every kind of publisher, nor can every person pay. Um, but we are very focused on anywhere that our platform touches a publisher, just making sure that we are generating as much value for them as possible. And our different products, as we've been talking about, are in different places on that spectrum. But it's definitely a core focus. Anything we roll out, that publisher value conversation is a core part of that conversation. Yes. Um, so I think, ooh, that was close. Um, with the latest Reuters news report, I think it's quite clear that news consumption in Asia is, um, is different compared to with the US. And I think a lot of new products or trials that you're rolling out is typically um, rolls out first, uh, well, where you're from. Do you have any plans actually to start trialing uh, anything um, with Asia as a priority? And I think the second one is, uh, is Facebook Watch coming soon to Asia? And, and if so, do you have a timeline for it? Thank you. So that's a great question. So even though I manage our work in North America, this topic is near and dear to my heart. Um, I think we need to be much more ambitious and aggressive about developing products internationally and then bringing them to the US or doing them both places at the same time. A lot of it really depends on the product though. Um, we just rolled out IGTV, which is a separate app for watching longer Instagram video. That rolled out globally on day one. Uh, and the watch team is taking a very different approach, obviously, with watch, whereas we're gonna develop this and iterate it and get it to a place where we think there's perfect product market fit, and then we're gonna look to roll it out elsewhere. So it does differ a lot product by product, but I think that's a great opportunity. Uh, I think in terms of watch, we don't actually have a firm timeline. 
Um, we're still trying to get the, the mix right in the US and are still evolving that product and are considering what other markets are gonna be right for that next. Um, we know in this region though, there's, there's actually a lot of mobile video consumption. So it's a really interesting opportunity, but within the Facebook app, it is still newsfeed that's driving most of that. I think we're going to have to cut it. And for the lady with the question, if you could come up and ask Jason afterwards. No worries. Yeah, All thank right. you so much. So I would like to thank Josh and Jason for a wonderful program. Thank you so much. Thanks to all of you.